Welcome back, lecture 56, math 241. We're about to uh, finish this thing up. We have a uh, little bit to do with binomial series today, uh, just to kind of put this class into perspective, not the students, but where we are. We just took our fourth test on Friday. Um, four of you got those back. I'll try to get the rest of them back tomorrow. Um, we have a couple days with applications of um, Taylor McLaurin binomial series and a day to talk about the exam. Uh, let me say something real briefly because this is so-called dead week and I think you're starting to kind of at least think about gathering up stuff to get prepared for exams. Um, probably your most important study guide for the final exam would be what? Your test. Okay. Uh, I think I've mentioned in here a couple times my philosophy of final exams, which was uh, came from when I was a student, that if it's not important enough to be on an individual test, then it probably doesn't have any business on the final exam. So those things that didn't quite make it because they weren't important enough, um, have I ever taken a final exam as a student where those things were on the exam? Yes. Did I think that was stupid? for them to be on the final exam? Absolutely, yes, that was dumb. Uh, so the only thing or things that have a chance of being on the final exam that weren't addressed in some way, shape, or form on a test would be what we're doing this week. So binomial series is kind of a low-level problem, made it to the most recent test, but we need to wrap that up in case it's not just ideally 1 plus x to the k. Um, and then what we do in 8.9 uh, has a chance of being on the exam. But other than that, if it didn't make it to a test, it's not on the exam. Now, I would study more than that um, because sometimes problems, there are three or four types of problems in a certain category, and you know only one of those made it to the test. You might want to look back at your notes and, and or the book and... Um, see what other kinds of problems fit into that category, but yet didn't quite make it to the test. So that, But still, your best study guide will be the four tests that we've had. Uh, somebody had a hand up while I do. Were you thinking about a question? Did I see a question brewing? No? OK. All right, well, let's wrap up 8.8 .8, the binomial series. Uh, where are we thus far? We are at this point. that if we have 1 plus x to the k, and if you wanted to do this battle, um, kind of any problem that we have that's in this form, if you wanted to also do that problem in a Taylor or McLaurin format, you could also do it that way and come up with an answer that is equivalent. But we have developed thus far using higher order derivatives and evaluating those at zero. One plus x to the k, and this was developed with integer values of k, but the convenient thing is that work, it works with non-integers as well. So we've seen that pattern. We saw some other patterns while we were developing this uh, that kind of helped us get to this point in this one. I guess we could also, it's a little awkward to put it in. closed form. Um, if you know it in this form, you can at least get to this point in the problem. And, and we know that this is n factorial, that this is the same thing. That's the power of x is also n. Uh, this number seems to be, what, 1 larger, right, in a sense that we're 
subtracting n and adding back 1, right, to end this. You may or may not have all these terms present. For example, uh, we've already looked at n equals 0, but let's say um, n equals 1. If n is 1, you've got k minus 1 plus 1. So it really doesn't go k and then k minus 1 and k minus 2 and then come out here to this point because what is k minus 1 plus 1? Okay. It's just k. So that's the only value. So this is here only to illustrate how we get from one term to the next. It doesn't mean that this will always be present, this will always be present, and all the other uh, successors will also be present. This just tells us where to start. This tells us how to proceed if, in fact, there is an additional term. And this tells us where to stop. So for n equals 1, we have a k and a k only. For n equals 2, k minus 2 plus 1 is k minus 1. So we have the first term and the second term, this one and this one. It's a little awkward at n equals 0. If that bothers you, you can say 1 plus this same thing and start n at 1. And that works as well. Um, if we have 1 plus x to, let's say, an integer, but not a, like a real boring problem like a positive integer, but let's say a negative integer, this is clearly not a polynomial expression. How would that expansion go so that it, on the right side it has the appearance of a polynomial? First term is 1. Next term is Okay, negative 3 would be the k value. Next term. Which is negative 4. Does that work? Next term. Negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, and so on, right? So we have this nice looking polynomial type expression, and clearly what we started with is not a polynomial. In order to be a polynomial, what has to be true about the exponents? <coughs> I mean, we've been talking about polynomials for a couple of weeks. Positive integers. Positive, or at least non-negative, right? You can have a 0. Here's an x to the 0. That's legal. Here's an x to the 1, x to the 2. So if they're non-negative integers, it's a, poly it's a polynomial. Clearly, this is not a polynomial expression. And we could simplify that stuff. Uh, suppose we had that, very similar to a test question. That would be 1 plus x to what power? One -fifth. Negative. 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 One fifth. So our k value is negative one fifth. So we know it works with positive integers. We're not even going to waste our time doing one of those. We know it works with negative integers. It should also work with rational numbers. What should the expansion look like? First term is 1. Negative one fifth. Negative one fifth. What do we do with that? That's the k value. What's the next term? Negative six fifths. Okay, k minus one. So one less than that is negative six fifths. So there's the x squared term. So this ought to look somewhat familiar. Not that we use this same problem, but similar to that. And what? So the um, 
interval or the radius of convergence. We do one in this case. We want the absolute value of x to be less than one. Uh, if we have anything that is going to be added to this interval of convergence, then we would basically check out our endpoints and see if it happens to converge there. Now there is kind of a general rule. Uh, it mentions this on page 619. Uh, we have enough kind of rules. We, we know what to do if we need to add to this. If it's, uh, we check this out, we get the interval, we want to check out the endpoints. We know how we can check those out to see if, in fact, it converges at the endpoints without memorizing uh, a couple of additional cases. But if you choose to do so, there's where it is in the text. All right, what if it's not in the nice, convenient form of 1 plus x? So all these so far have been 1 plus x to the k. So let's take a look at a problem, and then when we're done, let's take a look at how the picture looks and see if the picture makes the um, interval of convergence or the radius of convergence pretty evident. Okay, there's the first indicator that it's not going to be kind of straight letter perfect 1 plus x to the k. And here's another indicator that it's not 1 plus x to the k. But this isn't an awful example. It's just we've got to put it in, in that form. Now, granted, it's not going to be x, it's going to be something else that's going to go in that position in terms of x, and then we need to identify what the k value is, and we might have some extra baggage as well. So under this radical, and there are a variety of ways of accomplishing what we're about to do. So if you wanted to go about algebraically this process slightly differently, as long as you feel comfortable that everything you're doing is legal, there are a lot of ways to manipulate this. But under the radical, I'm going to factor out a 4, which makes that 1. What's the other term if I factor out a 4? 4. 4. 4. Okay. The square root of that 4 can come out as a 2. It's still in the denominator. And that's close, but we want it in the form of 1 plus something, something variable, raised to the k. Let's bring the 1 half out in front, and then we have 1 over the square root of 1 what plus negative x over 4. Does that look right? So the half is certainly part of our answer, but let's do the 1 plus variable something, in this case x or negative x over 4 raised to the k. 1 plus negative x over 4 to what power? Negative 1 half. Negative So for k, it's going to be negative a half. We've already done substitutions like that, but I don't want to say x equals negative x over 4 because that doesn't look right, but x is going to be replaced with negative x over 4. So the first term is 1. We want k, which is negative a half. Norm normally, it would be k times x, right? So there's our k, and instead of x, we have what? So there's k times x. What's the next term? k times negative 3 halves, which is k minus 1. Negative x 
and so on, right? Let's get one more term, and then we'll kind of gather some terms together. So we're still in the brackets here. Everything gets an extra one-half. So we've got k, k minus 1, k minus 2, all over 3 factorial our x value, which is now negative x over 4, cubed. So the first term is 1 half times 1. The next term is what? x over 8. Go ahead and distribute the one half. So there's a two and there's a four, so there's an eight, and then it also gets this one half, which is another two in the denominator, and it's positive. Is that true? Yeah. So one sixteenth x. Mm -hmm. Let's get one more. Positive? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. There's two negatives. Yeah. There's a negative squared, still going to be positive. So we're going to have a 3, there's a 2, a 4, an 8, and a 16. That 4 gets squared, so there's a 16 in the denominator. We've got an 8 in the denominator times this 2 gives us what, 16 times 16? Is that right? 256? Check me now. My arithmetic is certainly substandard. Uh, 3 over 256. We've got the negative x squared, which is just x squared, and so on. So we've got this nice, clean polynomial for a very ugly non-polynomial function. If we uh, took some different truncated versions of this and graphed them, if we took this version and called it T1, because you could develop this by a tailor and get the same thing. You would expect this particular truncated version of the polynomial to be linear. It has a y-intercept of 1 half and a slope of 1 16th, so fairly flat and shifted up a half of a unit. Now it gets a little more difficult to call as far as what it is, but we definitely know it's at least a parabola, right? And that parabola opens up, and we could continue with the different truncated versions of the complete series. Here's an interesting picture that is in your book. So here's what we just did a binomial series expansion on. There's T1, which we decided was a line, right? Y-intercept of 1 half and a slope of 1 16th. We decided T2 was a parabola that opened up, so we've got that pictured. Now, as we do better, we go from T1 to T2 to T3, what appears to be happening graphically. More accurate. Looks like it's kind of matching the curve itself. The curve itself is this guy right here. 
So as we do go from T1 to T2 to T3, it seems like it matches the actual curve a little better. There's the interval of convergence. You can see from negative 4 to 4 that all of these kind of match the original curve or the original solution curve. But again, T3 is doing a better job of matching it for a longer period of time. But you can clearly see that things begin to diverge as we get close to 4. And as we get close to negative 4, it's only going to get worse as we go beyond 4 to the right and to the left of negative 4. Uh, so the interval of convergence, I don't know, maybe we should validate that as well. How would we get the interval of convergence? When we had 1 plus x to the k, how, how did we come up with the interval of convergence there? I already did this once today, early. It was that, right? When that was x. We took that x value, its absolute value, and made it less than 1. Well, we don't really have an x occupying that position anymore, not on this one. So what should it be for this problem? Negative x, sir. Right. should be the absolute value of the thing that was serving as the x in the 1 plus x to the k, which is x over 4. less than 1. And we use that little algebraic manipulation. Multiply through by 4. And we get that interval of convergence that is hopefully pretty clearly illustrated on this picture. That it's the graphs are matching fairly well for that interval, and you can see that it doesn't seem to be the case uh, beyond that, that they're going to do a very good job. Okay, that's how to kind of do the problems in the 1 plus x to the k format, how to adjust a problem that isn't handed to us in exactly that format. Now, how could we use this? Um, and let's, let's go ahead and use this one because we have 1 over and let's backtrack to what we had. What did we have? One half one sixteenth x 3 over 256x squared. Let's get one more term, which would be negative there. And we're cubing a negative, so those two negatives give us a positive. We're going to have 3 and 5, 15 in the numerator, 2, 4, 8, an 8. Let's see what we're going to have in the denominator. We're going to have an 8. Um, we're going to have a 6 from the 3 factorial. We're going to have a 4 cubed. 64. From the negative x over 4, the quantity cubed. And then we've got a 2 out in front, right? From the 1 half. So it should be 15 over, what would that be? What is it? 61.44. Thank you. So there's the cube term. And there are others. That's maybe one too many, but at least we're not. So this is supposed to converge for values that we choose from x.
from negative 4 to 4. I don't know. Let's pick an x value in there and see if we can equate or find the value on the left side. Of course, calculators make this so easy that there's virtually not a problem with putting any x value in there between negative 4 and 4. Too easy to do on a calculator, but let's see if we can more or less get close to that value with this particular polynomial type series. How about negative 3? How about 0? <laughs> um, all right, let's do that first. Actually, we don't need to write anything down. That's a good suggestion. Um, if x is 0, it certainly is in the interval of convergence. And if x is 0 on this side, 4 minus 0 is 4. The square root of 4 is 2. And if we've got x equals 0, every term that has x will be gone, right? So all these terms are gone, and we're, we have 1 half. So it did a pretty good job when x is 0. Wouldn't any of them have done a good job when x is 0? Here's our picture. At x equals 0, there's not a whole lot of separation from t1 to t2 to t3. In fact, they're all going through that point. So we should expect it to be exact. Now, we're going to come out here to negative 3, and we do have some separation between the approximations and the curve itself. Let's see how well we do. So at x equals negative 3, we are in the interval of convergence. So the left side should be, and this will be our way we can check our answer to see if we're even close, 4 minus x, or in this case 4 minus negative 3, which is 4 plus 3. So there's what we're kind of headed for. I hope we get reasonably close. Now, without a calculator, how many of you are going to be able to do this? We have, an, uh, we have an energy conservation class, and we just set aside our calculators trying to conserve energy. We want that carbon footprint to be as small as we can possibly make it. So we don't have this guy. We can't use a calculator. I'm going to have a hard time doing that, but this side's pretty easy because it's just a polynomial. Polynomials are always pretty easy. I think I can handle that. Could you handle that? I don't know. It might get kind of complicated. We might have to square that. Think we can handle that? Think we could square negative 3? I'm still not liking that without a calculator. I don't know. We've got multiplication in addition to cubing. Do you think we could cube negative 3? I think we could cube that. But then we've got to multiply. And, oh, and then we've got to divide. I think we can all do everything that we need to do on the right side, right? Without a calculator, we may not like it. We don't like necessarily doing arithmetic without punching the buttons. I like it a lot better than this one. Does anybody in here know how to extract a square root? That's a dying art with young people. <laughs> an old-fashioned process called extracting a square root. Sounds like extracting a wisdom tooth or something, doesn't it? Sounds painful. You, do you know how to do that? Not really, but you could there you could get it down to like the square root, two times the square root of three, and I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, some geometry. between that's square root of four and square root. I mean, we could approximate probably, and we've got some approximating techniques. Uh, Newton's method could potentially work. Um, but well, I guess what I'm trying to say is you're never going to have anything worse than multiplication, division, and squaring, or cubing, or raising to the fourth. All right, let's see, get a couple calculators run. Of course, if we have a calculator, why can't we do this one? Right? I agree with that, that thought process. But let's, yeah. to avoid doing the arithmetic that we could do, uh, let's see what we get on the right side. Somebody also do this on a calculator. Take 1 and divide it by the square root of 7, and let's see how, how we've done. Three, seven, seven, nine, seven. 
is this? Point three seven seven nine six. Twenty-seven times fifteen. Four at five. Kind of doesn't to me seem at all out of character that this thing would be alternating, because one half clearly is too large, right? If you stop here, that's too large, and then we subtract three sixteenths, which means we probably subtract away too much, and then we have to add something back in. But we add too much back in, so we have to subtract something away. That's that's not shouldn't be a surprise. What, did you do the right side? Point three five two zero oh five. Not bad, and especially the way that we saw the curves being beginning to separate from the actual solution curve itself the further we got away from the origin because it was centered at zero and if we went to negative four and four begin to separate and we're kind of on the outer fringes of that but we can take something that is kind of without a calculator nearly impossible for us to do and turns it into an arithmetic problem that we would rather use a calculator for but if you were given 1 over the square root of 7 and you approximated it to be that, decent approximation. Okay, let me see, check my notes and see if we've done justice to this. I think we have. We have, and on a rare occasion we will end early because we will, we've got two days to do 8.9, which is plenty of time. So um, I will see you tomorrow.